Hey, welcome Living Church to our virtual LC lobby. I'm so pumped that you're already here, that you're ready and engaged to start the service today. You know, as you can see, we are just short of 15 minutes before service begins. And can I tell you, it's gonna be a powerful day. It's Easter Sunday, y'all, Easter like never before. So go ahead, go back to your kitchen, grab your coffee, get your kids set with Living Kids online on our YouTube page. You can find it, get them ready with their iPad pads get y'all all comfortable in the living room or or in the game room or in the family room wherever you're set up and ready to worship this morning can I tell you it's going to be a powerful day God is going to do some amazing things but this is our virtual lobby today we can't hug each other in the lobby but we can in the comments of this Facebook post as we're going live you can comment below I know my friends Jimmy and Kim, I know they're already logged on. I know they're already ready to welcome everybody and say hello. I know my friend Heather is already excited and engaged in what's gonna happen today. And so today, virtually, we can give each other virtual hugs by commenting below. We can give each other virtual high fives by saying, hey friend, what's up? When we notice that we're all checked in together, it's gonna be an amazing day. And I can't wait for you to continue to comment and engage in what's happening here at Living Church. In fact, our worship is gonna be so good. And I see Pastor Diana, she's walking this way. And so hello, Pastor Diana, hello. how are you? Good, good, good. Man, today's gonna to be so good, right? I'm so excited to be worshiping with everybody. This team is amazing. Yes, it's gonna be so, so good. excited. I'm so excited. So I've been telling everyone they can comment yes. and that's a way they can engage. What's another way they can engage in the, in the service and the message today? Something that I like to say is sharing is caring. That's good. So go on our Facebook page, find our service and tag a friend, tag your mom, your grandma, your uncle, your friend from high school, anybody, and let's get it out there, y'all. It's gonna be amazing. That's so right, excited. because they're gonna be so moved by the worship, yep. the incredible word that Pastor Dresden has. They don't wanna miss out. We don't right. want anyone to miss out. So one of the ways you can share is by tagging your friend. Another way is by, is it called a share row button? Yep. That's what exactly it's called. Exactly it. And so you click the share row and you share it directly on your own personal yep. page, right? Yep. It's awesome. And you can even put sharing is caring and say it's gonna be awesome, y'all. That's Super right, excited. sharing is caring, I love it. All right, wait, I gotta go, bye. bye. Yes, man, I hope that you'll in continue to share and engage with us. You know, we're just 12 minutes, 25 seconds away from the start of service, y'all. I'm so excited, I can't hardly wait. Pastor Matt. You're walking by, I know you gotta go, but can you tell the people, real quick, can you help them? Because Pastor Diana just said we can engage by sharing, but you know, we can also engage by standing up, right? Oh yeah, for sure, when I'm sure. When we're worshiping together, we can clap our hands. Yep, you can clap your hands, do a little side step. Whenever you hear that bass, when you hear Johnny ripping in that bass, oh, and you man. see the stink face, don't, don't right. be afraid of it. Join in, come on. We're, That's right. We, we don't have standstill worship, so. No, we engage in worship. We lift our hands. In fact, oh. can you teach him a little beat with your clap? Oh, okay, I got you. It's this one, it's two okay. and four. Two That's and four. That's all you gotta do. Okay. And then, uh, go left to right, left to right, right I'm here. On. I'm trying. And that's pretty good. And all you need now is that stank face, just Ooh, like you're yeah. like you're mad, like like something's good about okay. to happen. Come on. That's right. That's how it is. And then when <laughs> Pastor T has his message, we can we can shout, right? Yes. What what are good things to shout during oh, the message? That's good. That's what's up. Come on, Pastor. Amen. That's right. Come yeah. on, somebody. <laughs> as Pastor Trustin is preaching today, engage in the message. As the band is leading us into worship, y'all clap your hands, lift your hands. Worship is our is Easter oh, yeah, Sunday, yeah. Pastor Matt. Yeah, McKinley has a really good good clap move. I see her right there, so okay. she can come and show you. All right, well, you go on and get energy. ready for worship. Yes. And McKinley, yes. tell us the clap move you have for worship. Guys, now this one's a little crazy. It's a little wild, and you, you have to be super sophisticated, all right? If you use your hands and your feet, and you gotta move them together, ready? Okay. So you just keep it going the whole time. Okay. It's a great workout. Plus, we know you're engaged, and I want to see it. I want to. I want you to comment down below once we get started during worship, and I want you to tell us, Mick, I'm doing your move. McKinley, I'm doing your move. <laughs> that's that's good. It reminds me a little bit of like the hoedown back oh, yeah. when oh, I was yeah. in, from Oklahoma, y'all. 
But it's a good way to engage. Are you it's excited? Like, I'm so excited. I'm excited to see the pretty dresses. I'm so excited. I yeah, in it. fact, you can take a picture of what you're wearing yes. for Easter at Living Church. Take a picture, then post it in the comments. Y'all, we're trying to look good. We still tried to coordinate as a family, <laughs> even though we're in this different season. Yeah. And so take a picture of what you're wearing, even if it's your PJs. Put it in the comments below. I love your PJs. You I look we, great. Y'all look good y'all today. Look good. Man, thank you for joining of us. Course. I can't wait to hear you in words. It's gonna be so. What? Hey. Hey, handsome. Hey, How good are you? looking. What's okay. happening? What's this Yo, all about? Here? We are less than ten minutes. We're now at nine minutes forty-one seconds oh, before man. service begins. It's getting real. It's getting real. This handsome dude is my husband, Aaron. He's so uh, cute and looking nice. Okay. And we're coordinating as yeah, well yeah. together. That's y'all. all her doing, by the way, it's, not me. It's, hers. <laughs> For sure. That's true. That is true. It is my doing because it's Hey, important. service is going to be great, but one of the things that I'm looking forward to is what's happening after service. That's right. We have the drive through yeah. after party. Mm. It's happening, y'all. We're going to be handing junk out to people in their cars with a 10-foot pole. That's true. We want That's you to really be safe. Happening. We want you to be secure. And so Pastor Trustin has created an incredible yeah. uh, pole system for us to deliver eggs. Yeah. And, and take a picture, but most importantly, we're going to get to do communion yes. together with our families. Man, I'm so pumped. Yeah, it's gonna be and a great I think day. everybody's going to get a free bunny on the way out. No, I, I think. don't I think, think they are. In no? fact, I see some Easter oh. eggs over there. Could you go take care of all of that? <laughs> I got to go take care of some bunnies and some wrong eggs. Wrong information this morning, y'all. But man, continue to say hi as you log into the virtual. Whoa, 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 whoa! Why are you walking by but not saying hi? Whoa, Come on, I'm trying to get to church. Hey, she looks. Look at her white jacket. Speaking of. Of Pastor oh, Fashion looking so good <laughs> this morning. Stop. But hey, can we talk to them about the petting zoo? We can talk about the petting zoo, but I'm trying to talk about how pretty you are. Why oh, you, oh, why you let me, let me say that? I just looked up today. Y'all comment below. <laughs> tell Pastor Rachel how much you like her white jacket. And then she writes, this week, we got to go to a petting zoo. That's right. Now, we thought we were brave, but we, we are not we brave. We were really bad at it. <laughs> we are actually not good animal people or farmers and We're definitely not, not farmers. farmers but Y'all. you know we tried and we got to hold some baby uh, bunnies and we got to hold some sheep and some goat that's right and I met a friend yes. named Rita and so you you got to wait and find out Rita is days. really cute she got curly hair in the front <laughs> what is it business in the front party in the back y'all Rita be cute she's adorable she a llama y'all she a llama <laughs> but she cute and so man we had a blast I can't yeah. wait for everybody to see no it'll be fun it's gonna be we so much fun we can't wait to see what you're gonna think about our experience and that's right <laughs> it's gonna be a great day well yeah. i'm gonna keep going to church okay go to church telling the people in fact i'll be right back i'll be right back oh, oh, he, oh he coming back well maybe he'll come back here in a moment <laughs> but man we're excited for yes. Easter at living yeah. now thanks for stopping by yeah we'll see y'all in a little bit that's right <laughs> y'all comment below again we're just almost seven minutes away from the start of service. It's gonna be an incredible time as we connect and engage. There he is. What are you doing? I'm trying to say hi to all the people. Service starts in seven minutes. I know, but this is our virtual lobby, Pastor. We don't have an actual opportunity okay. to connect with each other. That's true. So we've got this virtual lobby where everyone can comment, say hello. Now they get to say hi to you. What's up, y'all? Y'all good? Now y'all remember what we do in the lobby. Right. We hang out, we high five, we hug next, we shake hands. But we can still do that via technology. Hello. And so share it out, That's post right. it, comment. I am about to preach. No, you're about to preach a really good word. I got a word, y'all. I already got to hear a little get, bit. Get ready. And I can't even wait. Get ready. It's so good. I'm telling you, it's Easter. It's like the greatest Sunday ever to tell the story of Jesus. And so if you've got friends or family that you've right. been wanting to introduce to Living Church, there's no greater opportunity than Sunday, Easter Sunday, right. and Easter like no other. So get them here. Okay, That's I gotta right. go. Okay, get you my go. notes ready. All right, Prep. Wait, wait, how long? Six minutes, 12 seconds. Six minutes, y'all, before it starts. And you know, what he said is so true. This word he has for the house is so powerful, but it's not just for the people who already attend Living Church, it's for all the people. Y'all, Jesus died and rose again to save all the people of the world. And so man, share it out. If you're a leader of this house, man, we've heard it. So many emails, phone calls, people saying, how can I help? How can I help in this season? Can I tell you how you can help? You can help by sharing the word of God out. You can share the Facebook live message, the story, the service that's happening. Share it out. When we put stuff on the content on our page during the week, share it out to everybody. Let them know and see the goodness of what God is doing in this house. Keep commenting. 
but sharing really is the caring. Sharing is how we take care of each other. Sharing is the way that we let everyone know that Jesus loves them more than they could even imagine. And so I need you to be a part by sharing. Leaders, that's how you do it, y'all. I see my son walking by, and y'all, this dude is about to kill it on some drums, right? I am about to, hopefully. People wanna know how many Band-Aids have you gone through in the last month while playing drums at Living Church? Last week, I uh, opened up my finger yet again, and so we went through two there. And why uh, does this keep happening to you? Mostly because I'm a fool and don't know where to hit the drums, but... It's, it's also because the power of the Holy Spirit oh, is making you drum amazing. and worship God in such an exciting way, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, okay, you got four minutes, yeah, 35 seconds till service starts. Oh, so you gotta hey. be on stage in two minutes. Hey. Yeah, I gotta go pee. He gotta go, he gotta hey. go. Oh, oh, what's up, Mo? What you doing? Hey, that's Mo. Yeah. That's one of our puppet friends from Living Kids, y'all. Living Kids! And, and you know, uh, I hope, I'm glad you're here today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. And so tell us how we can find the Living Kids service online. Oh man, Living Kids is all over the interwebbies. It is, it's on YouTube. YouTube. It's on our Facebook page. Facebook. You can even find a link on our Instagram. Yeah, Instagram, baby. And so Mo, do they have a good service for the kids today? Oh man, it is amazing. I bet. Kids, listen. We got a sweet service you got to be a part of. That's right. So don't just sit there with your mom and dad. Grab yourself some snacks. What's up? Snacks and go are good. And, and go and watch Living Kids Service. Yeah. That's right. Get some snacks. Put them in your bag. And hang out and watch the Living Kids Service right now online. YouTube is is where it's at, y'all. They've got it. Pull it up. Get it ready on your iPad. Mom and dad, go get your coffee. Get ready. You know, we've got three minutes, three 28 minutes. seconds. Whitney. You better go get behind the puppet stage I, I got to go. so that you can be a part of Living Kids Service today. I'm a real boy. That, yeah. Okay, Pinocchio. All right, y'all. Man, we've just got three minutes till service starts. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited that you're here and already a part of the LC virtual lobby this morning. It's Easter, y'all. It's Easter like never before. Come back and be a part of the after party drive through. It's going to be an incredible time. We've got two minutes, 58 seconds. And so one more thing, if I could share with you before we go, is that as you are a part, as you're sharing and commenting, man, we have an awesome opportunity to worship God with our giving today. To say, God, I trust you with everything that I have. And so I know you're good and faithful and I'm gonna worship you with my giving. You can go online, livingchurch.com slash give. Then you can follow the prompts and click until you can set up auto draft. You can give straight from your bank account. You can give with your debit card uh, online on that way. You can. Also, text to give at 84321. You just text the dollar amount of what you want to give and you then follow those prompts and you can give in that way. You can mail it in to 2271 Matlock Road here in Mansfield. God is doing incredible things through his house and it's because of your faithfulness to give that we're able to do that. Two minutes, y'all. We'll see you soon. Service is about to begin.
yes, I am born again. Forever safe in the Savior's hands. Yeah, you are more than my words can say. I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days. I'll fix my eyes, follow in your ways. Forever free in the land of grace. Cause you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, we lift you higher.
to our YouTube page, you can pull up our Living Kids service so that they can be having their Easter service while you're having your Easter service as well. And if it's your first time to join us here at Living Church Online, can I just say welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We can't wait to meet you in person. But until then, if you'll text the words, welcome to 555-888. That way one of us pastors can call you and connect with you this week. We're so glad you're a part of the family of Living Church. As we continue in worship together, we're gonna pray and, and worship God in this place. God, we love you. We're so grateful to worship you today. We're so thankful for what you did for us, Jesus. And we celebrate your resurrection today on Easter Sunday. God, continue to move in this place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Yeah. 
soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body held not remain our God has robbed the grave and our God has robbed Before we do that, I want to encourage you with a scripture on our heart this week. Psalm 121 says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? That's part saying, does my help come from what's in front of me? And the rest of the scripture says this, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleep. God is not asleep. He is working on your behalf. And it says the Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and as you go, both now and forever. You know, this week, we're going to pray that God would allow us to know his power. And we're going to pray that the hope that is within us, that we have in him, will arise. So we're going to continue to pray together just like we have every week. If you will bow your hand, bow your heads and raise your hands right there where you are. Let's agree in prayer together. God, we thank you. Thank you that we can have hope in you. God, let this hope that we have in you arise within us and through us, God. Lord, we know that we can trust you, God. Lord, we continue to pray for healing over our city, God, over our state, over our country, God, over our world, God. We pray healing. We pray peace. We pray provision, God. Lord, we know that you are working on our behalf, God. Lord, and we stand in agreement, Lord, knowing that the best days are yet to come, God, and that we can stand confidently hopeful in what you have for us today. In your name we pray, amen and amen. 
let's continue to worship together.
and you turn it for good. Come on. And you turn it for good. 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 This morning we sing this song as a declaration, believing that no matter what's in front of us, that we're going to see a victory because we serve a God who can turn a situation that we don't see hope in into something that brings prosperity into our lives. And so if you're at home today and you're afraid and nervous or overwhelmed, I want you to know victory is headed your direction, that we serve a God who cannot be defeated, that when you don't see his power, you can always trust his plan, that God is working on your behalf. Father, right now, we've taken some time on this unique Easter Sunday to shut off all the other noise of the world and to focus on you. And God, we invite you into our situation, into our family, into our finances, even into our fear. And we believe that you are going to work this for our good. Can I tell you that God has the power to turn this whole thing around? Can I tell you that God is up to something? That God's up to something. For the last six months, Rachel and I have had a song in our hearts that we've been playing in our home. Every time I'm coming to and fro, I've got it playing in my truck. Rachel's got it playing in the house for the kids. And it's a song that helps us to understand that God wants to turn it around. And so this morning, I've asked our worship team and Pastor Matt to sing the song over us as a prayer so that we would believe and understand that God's going to turn it around because in heaven, he's up to something. So I want this song to minister to you as a prayer over your situation. Turn it around, God, turn it around, God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. God, turn it around, God, turn it around, God, turn it around. All of my hope is in the name. The name of Jesus, breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. I'm praying God come and turn this thing around. God turn it around, God turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. Yeah. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. God, turn it around, 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 God, turn it around. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making way for someone. God is doing something right now. He is 
Just moving mountains, making way for someone. God is doing something right now. He is moving mountains, making way for someone. God is doing something. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. And all of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it. You turn it around. God, turn it. You turn it around. You turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Turn it around. God, turn it around. Turn it around. Turn it around, turn it around. Jesus, right now we thank you, Lord, that you've made a way for us to come into a, a certain situation or a circumstance and you just take over and you turn it around. Lord, we thank you in your name. Amen. Living Church. Living Church. We're so glad you've joined us online today. Yes. Man. Hey, we're celebrating Easter like never before. That's right. At Living Church Online today, Man, aren't we? it's an incredible day. And if it's your first time joining us online, can we just say welcome? Oh, yes, absolutely. We're so glad that you're joining us online. And we would usually have a gift for you in person. That's but right. we're doing the next best thing. That's right. So you can text the word welcome to 555 888 and that way a, an elder a pastor a leader can connect with you this week and then soon we hope we'll get to meet you in person That's right but i hope you'll let us welcome you this morning to easter online you know i love easter and normally we do Best. a big celebration, but we're not going to miss out on the celebrating today. No, no, no. We're not going to miss out no, on that's any right. of that. After service today, we're going to have a drive through after party. That's right. So today, after this service from 1130 until 1 yep. is our drive through after party here at our main Matlock that's location. Right. That's right. We're going to have some really cool things lined up for you. First, we're going to do communion from your car. For right? the whole family, that's yes. right. We will distribute communion elements that you can take home with you for you and your family to do communion together. We've got the juice box prepared. We've got individually yep. wrapped crackers for you, tiny baby communion cups. We will distribute those to your car. And then inside the bag is the instructions for how you and your family can do that's communion right. together. It's simple. 
but it's incredible because we get to do it together yeah, such a safely thing. inside our homes. Absolutely. Tell them what else they're we're getting gonna, at the after party. After that, we're going to have Easter eggs for the kids. That's right. Hey, we know what Easter's about here at Living Church, and so we're going to make sure that the kids get in on the fun as well. So we're going to have Easter eggs that we're going to make sure get to you in your car in a safe manner. That's right. And so we'll give you Easter eggs for the kids so that they can have fun. And then moms, we're not going to miss that family photo. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. We're going to make sure that you get your family photo Absolutely. on Easter. We're going to do it from your car. We're going to have a really cool backdrop. And listen, we're going to check it off the list. We know what you guys want. That's Mom, right. What mama wants, mama gets. That's right. right? On Easter, we won't miss out. In fact, we'll have a, a picture that we can commemorate this incredible special Easter. And so join us today, right after it's service, gonna be great. 1130 to 1 for our drive through after party. It's yes. going to be incredible. You know, this season has been difficult a little bit. It's, it's been, been trying for different. our family. We've been learning a new way and a yeah. new normal. You are working full time. That's true. From home. From home. I'm working full time from home. The kids have been schooling full time, full -time from, from home. home. And true. so, man, we're learning a new way. How are you feeling about uh, how it's going? I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying. You're trying. Hey, yeah. you know, I think in this season, we're all trying. We're For all sure. doing our best. And so we have a brand new series starting the week after Easter. Next Sunday, we launch this brand new series called I'm Trying. I'm trying. And we're going to learn to try to make it together and to step into the more that God has for us. And so join us as we launch this brand new series. Yeah, it's gonna but be it's great. not just a new series. We're also launching new service yeah, times. Yeah, for sure. New service times is going to start after today. That's it's right. It's going to be at 930 and 1115. That's right. You know, at our new location, when we step into it soon, we will be having those service times at 930 and 1115. But we want to go ahead and make that happen now. So right. online every week. Now you can join us at 930 and 1115. And if you're a regular LC attender, hop on early, y'all. Hop on at 15 minutes early. We're going to have some fun, some excitement that you can engage with us. Get prepared and ready for the day and so awesome. man it's going to yeah. be a blast but those new service times are 9 30 and 11 15 i can't wait it's going to be so good oh it's going to be the best you know today if you're a regular attender of living church i just want to encourage you don't forget to be faithful to god in your offering in your worship of giving to god you know he's so good and everything we have comes from him and so that makes it really easy to trust him with everything that we have we can give online at livingchurch.com give you can text to give at 84321 you can bring by your offering and drop it in the mailbox here at the living church building but man i just want to encourage us all to be faithful to god today that's right amen amen Man, Absolutely. I love Easter Easter's at Living Church. Easter is going to be great this year, and I'm sure you guys have had a great time already. But there's one thing that I really kind of miss, and that is the petting zoo that we have every year at Living Church. You know, you usually know? we have a great petting zoo with all kind of animals. We do. We got the pigs yes. and the goats. The bunnies love the kids. You the gotta kids love, love the, bunnies, the bunnies. That's right? right. Yeah. But don't worry, love. We didn't leave you hanging. No. In fact, we took care of it. Pastor Rachel and I went this week oh. to our local petting zoo, and we have a virtual petting Come zoo on. experience for you. Y'all check it out.
Those girls are cracking me up. Pastor Whitney and Rachel at the virtual petting zoo. I was laughing so much at how many times the goats kept jumping up on Pastor Whitney. She didn't realize if you're carrying the bread, the goats are going to keep on chasing you. When they got back to the church, I said, hey, listen, y'all stank. Y'all got to go home, take a shower. Something bad has happened to y'all. Y'all stank. Well, listen, welcome to Easter at Living Church, everybody. We're so glad that you're here joining us online from your homes. Man, I believe that God has something great for all of us at this Easter-like never before. This really is an Easter like I've never experienced you in my life. I've had a lot of fun Easters and a lot of crazy Easters and a lot of really meaningful Easters, but this one is one like I've never experienced before. As a kid, man, I looked forward to Easter. It was one of my mom's favorite holidays, and so every year I would wake up and have a big Easter basket And in the Easter basket was all kind of goodies for me. Got that Cadbury egg with caramel. Come on, somebody. That'll preach right there. Mom always had me a chocolate bunny, and she didn't go cheap and give me that hollow chocolate bunny. You know we got the solid chocolate bunny in the Baba house, and so I was excited about that. And then we would have an Easter egg hunt around our home. My mom and dad would take Easter eggs and hide them under the couch and stick them in my dad's shoes and put them up on top of dressers. And I would run around the house and look for all these goodies. And man, Easter was so fun growing up with all of these memories. And when I got a little bit older, I had the experience at my church to be the guy in the Easter bunny costume. You know, you see the mascot. I got to be the Easter Bunny mascot. And can I tell you, I was killing it, y'all. I was hopping around and giving kids candy. And it was so fun. But I've also had a couple crazy Easter's where really weird and and strange things would happen. I grew up in a church where my pastor was really creative, and he was always trying to do some funny things. And one Easter Sunday, he got the bright idea to get a guy in the church who kind of looked like Jesus, which just meant he had a scraggly beard and some long hair. And so they get this guy, and they put a white robe on him, and they rented a donkey. And so mid-message, a donkey walks down the aisle with this Jesus lookalike on it. My pastor is talking about it. And can I tell you, before the donkey made it up the ramp to get on the stage, the donkey decided to do his business at the altar. And so Easter morning, this donkey takes a dump in the altar, and the smell just wafts through the entire church. Thankfully, we had an usher team that knew what they were doing. And one of the ushers took off his jacket, dove on the pile of poop like it was a grenade, and like he was Captain America, and he scooped it up and ran out of the building because God can't be stopped. Come on now. I remember the next year, my pastor said, well, man, I've got to do something else kind of fun and crazy. And so he got the same guy dressed as Jesus, and they got some dudes to put a winch in the ceiling. And he was teaching on the ascension about when Jesus ascended to heaven after the resurrection. And so a guy dressed as a disciple clips a wire on Jesus' belt and Jesus starts levitating up into the heavens, but something went wrong with their bootleg winch system and Jesus got stuck about 15 feet off the ground, just legs kicking. My pastor had to preach his whole message with a dude hanging from the ceiling. Come on, Easter's can get crazy sometimes. But I think the craziest Easter I ever had was when I was a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor, and my lead pastor, he wanted to do something fun before service started, and so he wanted the world's largest petting zoo. And so we went for it, y'all. I was calling everybody, trying to find some animals to come out to this petting zoo, and I found a guy in Dallas who had a camel farm. Here in Dallas, we got some camels. Oklahoma, tigers. Here in Dallas, we got some, ti- we got some camels. And so we brought this camel out, and people are petting the camel, and they got camel rides and all the things. And I'm like, man, I won. I did good for my pastor. And then all of a sudden, I look over, and the camel is laying down in the church parking lot. And I walk over there, and I'm like, hey, hey sir, uh, we're paying for this camel rental by the hour. Why is this camel laying down on the job? What is going on? And he said, well, can't you see? It's like, what do you mean, can I see? He said, this camel is pregnant. I said, I don't know if that camel's pregnant. It got two humps on the top. I don't know what that thing on the bottom is. I don't know what's going on. And so next thing I know, this camel man has a rope tied around two hooves coming out of this camel, and me and this guy are playing tug of war with a baby camel. And can I tell you, I am now a certified camel birthologist. Come on now. I helped this guy give birth to a camel. I've had some crazy, crazy Easter's. I've also had some really meaningful Easter's. I've had some Easter's growing up that I realized it wasn't about the eggs, it wasn't about the candy, it definitely wasn't about a donkey, but that Easter is about so much more. It's about us realizing that God loves us, 
that no matter what we've done, no matter the decisions that we've made, that there's a good God in heaven who desires to have a relationship with us. And even when I was full of bad choices and making bad mistakes, that Jesus would come and allow himself to be sacrificed on a cross to pay for the sins that I committed that I couldn't pay for. And man, I've had a lot of unique Easter's. But this one, it might top them all. This Easter might top all of the fun and crazy and meaningful Easter's that I've ever had. Because this Easter, there are no Easter egg hunts. This Easter, there are no big gatherings. This Easter, we're probably not going to go to grandma's house for dinner. So this one is an Easter like never before. And can I tell you, this Easter isn't going the way that I thought that it was going to. I had a plan and a strategy as a pastor. Easter is a big day, and I had it all planned out of what it was going to look like. But can I tell you, sometimes what you thought things were going to be don't turn out how they are. It's not how I thought it was going to go. Rachel and I, we had plans through the fall. We had things in our schedule, things in our calendar. That now the e-break has been pulled on our plans, and life looks very different. And we're looking at the summer, and the summer schedule is even starting to shift. And that creates a lot of change. It's not what I thought it would be. And I'm sure that you're at home on this Easter Sunday, and there's some things in your life that are going in a direction that you didn't think like they would go. But I have to remember in my mind and in my heart that I'm not the first person to feel like this. Can I tell you that the Bible is full of stories of men and women who their life went a direction that they didn't plan but it didn't surprise God. God was still on the throne in heaven in charge and sovereign over the situation that even though we don't understand, God is in control. The Bible's full of stories of people who were looking for things to go one way, but then something hit their life and it changed their reality. Things didn't go according to plan because somebody else did something. Because of someone else's decision, their life was affected and that's what's happening to all of us. I think of the story in the Bible of Joseph. Joseph had a great relationship with his father. His dad loved him so much that he made him a coat of many colors, also known as a technicolor dream coat. And he gave it to Joseph, and Joseph was excited, and he's strutting around town in this coat, and Joseph's older brothers got jealous of the gift. Have you ever had someone get jealous of you? And so the brothers strip the coat off their brother, and they throw him into a pit, and then they sell him into slavery. This was not a part of Joseph's life plan. He never thought, you know what would be great is if my brother sold me into slavery. And now he finds himself in Egypt. He gets sold to a guy named Potiphar. He's working for Potiphar, and Potiphar has a wife who's a freaky cougar. Come on now. This freaky cougar's trying to get with Joseph, and Joseph's like, uh-uh, back off of me, lady. And he ran out of the house. Well, the cougar got her feelings hurt. And so she tells a lie about Joseph, and now Joseph is thrown into prison. He's in a foreign land as a slave in prison. Can I tell you, his life was not going the direction that he thought that it was going to go. I think of the story of a lady in the Old Testament named Jochebed. You might not know who that is, but she was Moses' mom. Ladies, do you remember when you were pregnant with your first child? I remember when Rachel and I were pregnant with our first child. Child, we were so excited. There's so much energy, so much anticipation about what this child's life is going to be. And Jochebed had all those same feelings. And then she gets news from the government that something has shifted. She gets news that all of the Israelite babies that are born are going to be killed. Because the Pharaoh is afraid that someday an army is going to rise up out of Israel. And so that was not a part of her plan. And so she hid Moses away and tried to take care of him. But this was not how she thought life was going to go. When Moses grew up and he got a little bit older, he, he went to lead the people out of Egypt. And God sent the plagues, and the Egyptians gave them gold as they were leaving to get out of the city. And as Moses is leading the people away, he hits the Red Sea with a million Israelites with him. And the Bible says that they heard the hooves of the chariots. Pharaoh got mad about what happened, and he sent his army to come and kill the Israelites in the desert. And Moses is now trapped between a rock and a hard place, and the situation didn't go the way that he thought it was going to go. Have you ever been stuck between a rock and a hard place? Have you ever found your life going a direction that you didn't think that it was going to go? I think of the story of Daniel. Daniel was a faithful man who always prayed. He was in a great relationship with God, and an evil king sent out a law that said, you're not allowed to pray. But Daniel said, I'm going to be faithful and be obedient to what the Lord tells me to do. And so Daniel prayed anyways. Yeah. And so man came and grabbed Daniel, and they threw him into a lion's den, into Daniel's lion's 
den. Can I tell you, that was not on his calendar. That was not on his agenda. He did not have a reminder that said, in three weeks, get thrown into the lion's den. Sometimes life goes a direction different than we anticipate. But in every one of those stories and many more, God came into the situation and he turned it around. He turned the story around, he turned the situation around, and he worked it for their good. In Joseph's story, he's thrown into a pit and into prison, and while he's there, the king has a dream. And nobody can interpret the dream, but God gives Joseph the gift to interpret dreams. And so he's released from prison, he gives the information to the king, and the king puts him second in command of all of Egypt. A famine hits the land, and through Joseph's wisdom, he navigates that hard situation till eventually one day there's a knock on the door and it's his very brothers who threw him in the pit. Joseph doesn't curse them or kill them, but instead he embraces them and loves them and he steps into being a hero of his people. But I want to read to you what Joseph said about that situation. Genesis 50, verse 20. Joseph says to his brothers, you plotted evil against me. Listen to this. But God turned it into good. God turned it into good in order to bring about this present result to save the lives of many people. Can I tell you, God will take what the enemy meant for evil and he'll turn it for your good. God has the ability and the power to turn situations around. Now, I want to point out one thing that Joseph said. He said, you plotted evil against me. You brothers, you guys are the ones that had this plan. And church, can I tell you, that God did not cause the sickness, that God did not bring the sickness into our world, that the devil has been planning and plotting and preparing for years. God didn't cause the sickness. You see, God doesn't change his mind about who he is. He's not good to us one day and bad to us the next day. He doesn't love us one minute and curse us the next minute. We do not serve a schizophrenic God. God did not bring this, but yet God has the power to turn it for our good. He didn't just do it for Joseph. He did it for Moses' mom. Moses' mom has a little baby Moses. She puts him in in a basket, and she covers the basket with tar. She doesn't know what to do, and she feels like the Lord leads her to take him down to the Nile River. She drops the baby in the Nile River, and because of God's providence and his timing, Moses floats down the river the same moment that the princess of Egypt comes out to have a pool party. Come on, somebody. And the prince is out there splashing along with her friends, and she hears a little baby in the basket saying, goo goo ga ga, and she runs over and she sees baby Bo- Moses in the basket, and she scoops him up in her arms, and now Moses is positioned in a place that he could have never got on his own to do something incredible in the future. God will take what the enemy meant for evil, and he will turn it for your good. Yeah. And the princess is standing there with this baby that she has a love towards now because of God. And she says, well, I don't know how to raise a baby. I have to find someone who can help me raise this child. And she looks over and she finds a relationship with Moses' own mother. And Moses' own mother goes from about to lose her child to being on the payroll for the king to raise her own son that was destined to be killed. This is what our God does. We serve a God of the turnaround. I think of the story of Moses as he got older. Moses is leading the people out of Egypt and he hears the hooves of the chariots chasing in the Red Sea in front of him and he doesn't know what to do. But God parts the Red Sea and Moses leads the people through the water to the other side towards the promised land. And here comes the Egyptian army coming to kill them. But God in his goodness, he closes the walls of the water down on Moses' enemy and in one fell swoop, he erases the problem. Moses doesn't have to look over his shoulder for the rest of his life because God has the power to turn it around. Can I tell you that God is not deaf or blind to what you're going through? He is working for our behalf and he's gonna turn it around. Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel gets thrown into the den of lions and the Bible says that God sent an angel to close the mouth of the lion and Daniel slept like a baby that night. In the next morning, the king ran and looked into the den and he said, Daniel, has your God saved you? And Daniel says, my Lord has saved saved me. They pull Daniel out of the pit and the king and all of the people of the land start to worship God because of Daniel's faithfulness in a scary situation. Church, can I tell you, I know there's some scary things happening right now. Be faithful. Believe that God is with you and he's for you and he's going to turn this thing for your good. I know things aren't going how you planned. They're not going how I planned. I know you're scared. Some days I'm scared. I know we get worried and anxious, but our God is a God of the turnaround. 
And the Bible is not just stories of what God did, but it's a story of who he is. God is not a God who can turn it around. He is the God of the turnaround. It's who he is. It's his personality. Our God is the God who directs our steps out of impossible situations. Our God has the ability to float us into blessing. Our God can defeat our enemy in one moment. This is who our God is. Our God is able to save us from the fire and the flood and from the mouth of the lion all at the same time. That's who he is, not just what he does. And so this Easter Sunday, that's like never before. What I want you to remember is that God is with you, that he's for you, and that he will turn the situation around for your good. You might say, well, pastor, all those stories you just told are Old Testament. What's the Bible have to say in the New Testament? Well, I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, New Testament says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. Come on, somebody. That is the best scripture for this season, that God works all things for the good. It says, and we know, and we know, and we know. The first part, and we know. You know, the truth that we know is the truth that sets us free. Scripture says it's the truth of God that sets us free. That when we would put his word in our mind and hide it in our heart, that that's where freedom would come from. It goes on, and it says, in all things. God works it not just in some things, not just in easy things to understand, not just in simple things, but in all things, in good and bad, that God works. He works it. He worked that thing. God knows how to work that situation. Notice it says that he worked it, he didn't bring it. You with me? Don't get your theology confused in scary situations. He worked it, he didn't bring it. Somebody else brought it, an enemy brought it into the situation, but God worked that thing, that God works it for the good, for our betterment, for our benefit, for our advancement. God knows how to work that thing. He knows how to put it down, flip it, and reverse it. God knows how to work that thing on this Easter Sunday. We sang a song in worship this morning that said, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for our good. And right now, I need you to understand that you might not see God's power in your situation, but you can trust his plan that God is working for your benefit and he's gonna turn this thing around. But who's the promise to, pastor? You're up there teaching on this verse. Who is it written to? Let me read it. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of who? Of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, this promise is to people who are in a relationship with God. Let me ask you a question. Are you in a relationship with Jesus? Do you know God? Do you spend time with the Lord? Are you in a relationship with him? Because this is a promise for people that are in a relationship with God. Now, don't get it confused. This doesn't mean that Christianity is just a life of cotton candy and rainbows and unicorns, right? That's not what the Bible promises. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us this in John 16, He says, in this world... You will have trouble, but take heart. Grab a hold of your emotions, grab a hold of your mind, take heart. I have overcome the world. This is the promise that God has over us. These present trials will be turned for good, either here on earth or in heaven. We can pray, God, turn it around, turn it around, turn it around. And we don't understand the answer. What we can be faithful of and understand is that God will turn it around either on this plane or in heaven. He'll turn it around for us. Now, Jesus, he says something else in that verse before he even says that. Verse 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you might have peace. Peace. And I think the thing that's being stolen from the most people is peace. But when we would remember that we're going to have trouble, but that Jesus has already overcame the trouble of this world, it can help us step into a new level of peace. The good news about God is that he always acts within the consistency of his character, that God doesn't shift how he handles things. So the Father God in the Old Testament turns situations around. But the Son of God, Jesus, in the New Testament does the same thing. He turns situations around. There was a time that Jesus shows up at a wedding 
and the wedding party ran out of wine. And Jesus turned the party around. He said, let me get some water. I'm going to turn it back into wine. I'm going to get this party started back up. Jesus is the God of the turnaround. There was a time that Jesus was walking to a city and a blind man named Bartimaeus shouted out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And the Bible says that Jesus stopped. It's some of the most powerful verses in all of scripture that Jesus stopped. You know, the Bible says that when we pray that God bends his knee and he turns his ear to be attentive to our request, Jesus stopped to engage with a blind man who had nothing to offer him and Jesus healed him and turned his whole life around. There was a time that Jesus was walking in a big crowd and there was a woman who had an issue for 12 years. She was sick. She spent every dollar she had on doctors trying to find a cure but had no hope. And the Bible says that she pushed through the crowd just to touch the hem of Jesus' garment and when she did, Jesus turned around. Can I tell you that God's paying attention to what's happening and that when you ask him for something, he's paying attention He's listening, that God will turn and look at you to your situation. And the Bible says that Jesus talked with this woman and touched her, and she was fully healed. No doctor could heal her except for the great physician. God was able to turn it around. Jesus had a close friend named Lazarus, and he got word that Lazarus was sick, and then Lazarus died. And Lazarus' sisters were broken hearted, and they wrote a letter to Jesus asking him to come. And four days later, Jesus shows up in the scene, and he shouts at the cave, Lazarus, come forth. And like a thrill of video, Lazarus comes out wrapped up in the mummy clothes, and he took Lazarus from death to life because this is who our God is. He didn't only do it in the Old Testament or the New Testament. He does it for us today. There was a time that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. And some religious people wanted to trap Jesus. So they went out and they found a prostitute who was engaged in her act. She was caught in the act of adultery. And they brought her in and they threw her at the foot of Jesus. And they said, Jesus, the old law, the law of Moses, says that we have legal right to kill her. What do you say? Jesus looked at the men that were bringing condemnation on her and he said, let those of you without sin cast the first stone. Can I tell you if you're watching, I'm sorry if a Jesus follower brought shame or condemnation on you. But what you have to understand is that's not who our God is. That he's not a God of shame. That he's a God of forgiveness and love. And Jesus looks down to this woman that would be considered untouchable by the religious people of the day, and he takes her by the hand, and he says, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. And he turned her entire life around because that's who Jesus is. He turns situations around. When all of this COVID-19 stuff started, the very first Bible story that came to my mind was one in Mark chapter four. Jesus, he tells his disciples to get in a boat and he says, hey guys, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And as they're sailing across the lake, scripture says that a furious squall, a storm blew in. Now the disciples were experienced fishermen. They had been in storms before, but this was a storm like no other. This storm did not send notice it was coming. Can I tell you, drama in your life never sends a memo. They were not ready or prepared for the chaos they were about to have to navigate. And it felt like their boat was about to sink as the waves were crashing and the wind was blowing. And they got terrified. They got panicked. And they ran down and they found Jesus asleep in the bottom of the boat. And they shake Jesus awake and they say, Jesus, don't you even care that we're about to die? I think that sometimes when scary things happen, we can start to ask that very same question. Hey, God, don't you even care? God, don't you even care? Aren't you even with me? But you see, what the disciples forgot is that Jesus was in the boat. They forgot that they were in relationship with him. And if you're in relationship with Jesus, he promises to turn it around either on this plane or in heaven someday. And so Jesus wakes up and he walks to the front of the boat like Leonardo DiCaprio, and he says, peace, be still. And the wind and the waves calmed down and the sea was smooth as glass. And Jesus looks at the disciples and he asks them, Where is your faith? Why are you so afraid? And if I could be honest and transparent with you, I'd say that God's been asking me that question a lot lately. He's been asking Rachel and I that question a lot lately. Tristan, why are you afraid? Have you forgotten that you are secure in the palm of my hand? 
Have you forgotten how mighty I am and the promises that I have already given you? Because you see, when I forget the promises of God, I start to get shaking on my own. But when I remember that I stand in the palm of his hand and nothing can pluck me out from that, it allows me to walk with confidence in everything that God has called me to do. Come on, somebody. This is Easter Sunday, Living Church, that we would remember that we serve the God of the turnaround. What are you afraid of? I know it's scary. I know we're in an unprecedented time, that we're in an unknown time, that we don't know what's next, but can I tell you, we can trust God. Jesus spent his whole life healing the sick, loving the unlovable, meeting needs and doing the miraculous. Jesus caused countless people to have a turnaround. But the greatest turnaround that Jesus caused happened at the cross. It happened on Good Friday. You see, the cross is the hinge pin of the whole Bible. The entirety of scripture is hinged upon what happened at the cross. That we would remember that God is good, he is with us, that he is for us. The cross is the turning point, the shifting moment of everything. Because before the cross, mankind had to pay for their own sin. Mankind, people like you and I, we had to pay for the sins that we committed. When we messed up, when we made a mistake, we had to go and get an animal and bring an animal to a priest. And the priest would sacrifice that animal and go behind a curtain so they could pray to God on our behalf. But this broke God's heart. You see, Romans 3.23, it says this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's me, y'all. I've super sinned in my life. And that's you too. And all the way back to Adam and Eve, every single person that's ever lived has sinned. And that sin, it separates us from God. That's why God instituted this plan of payment through sacrifice. So people would bring their animals to the priest and the priest would sacrifice them. And they would go into a little room to connect with God on our behalf. And that's how people's sins were washed away. But that was complicated. And that was messy. And people got involved and made it super religious and hard to be a part of, and it broke God's heart. But you see, us intentionally dealing with our own sin is a big deal. It's not something we should only think about on Easter. It's something that we have to be aware of. Look at what the Bible says in Romans 6.23. It says the wages, the payment, the cost of sin is death. But here's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we're not sentenced to death. We have the opportunity to step into a new life. And it's no longer through a priest or a sacrifice. It's through what Jesus did on the cross that we can be forgiven of the sins that we've committed. Jesus, he had done all of these amazing things, healing people and providing and doing miracles, but they were all leading up to this moment on the cross. Jesus' focus shift, shifted from healing and, and teaching. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus says this. It says, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. That Jesus knew that his time was near for the cross. The Bible says that when he came into Jerusalem, that people were celebrating and praising God and that they were cutting palm branches and waving them. It's like the equivalent of a big foam finger at a football game. And they're saying, Jesus, you're, you're number one. And men were taking off their jackets and laying them in the street as honor, saying, Jesus, we're with you. And Jesus is riding in on a donkey that made it all the way to the destination, right? And so when Jesus gets into town, can I tell you what he did? He went to the church, but not to worship, not to preach, but to get into a fight. The Bible says that Jesus picked up a whip Sometimes we get this picture of Jesus like he's this little, quiet, gentle, soft individual. But can I tell you, Jesus was a man's man. Jesus was a carpenter who picked up a whip and he went into the church and he cast out all of the people that were taking advantage of people trying to get close to God. He kicked out the money changers and flipped over their tables. He kicked out the people that were selling sick animals to people and taking advantage of them because he realized that he was there to stop the debauchery. He was there to stop the confusion that he was the sacrifice, that he was the Lamb of God. And after this moment, everything shifted for Jesus because the religious leaders started watching what he was doing and planning and plotting to kill him because what Jesus was teaching 
would mean that they would be out of a job. In their own selfishness, they tried to hide the Savior of the world. And in the same moment, the Roman Empire started watching Jesus because people were shouting that he was going to overthrow their tyranny. And as they're watching Jesus, they conspire a plan. And they have a secret meeting with a guy named Judas, who is one of Jesus' disciples. And they pay him off to hand Jesus over to them. After the Last Supper, after the last time that Jesus had a meal with his closest friends, and after they had communion, he took the disciples to a garden to pray. It's known as the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a garden at the foot of a mountain called the Mount of Olives. The Garden of Gethsemane was a olive garden, which is representative of what Jesus was about to go through. Because the way that you get the oil out of the olive is through a crushing, is through pressure, is through a pressing. And Jesus goes into this olive garden understanding that he's about to be pressed and that the vitality of his life is going to flow out, but it's going to provide salvation for the world. And so Jesus is there and he begins to pray. And it says this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Listen. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Can you hear the anguish in his voice? And he says, stay here and keep watch with me. But all the disciples fell asleep. You know, Jesus can relate to your sorrow. He can relate to the feeling of feeling overwhelmed. Jesus knows what it's like to be under pressure and to be alone. Scripture tells us in Hebrews that we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. That we don't serve a God that doesn't know what we're going through. That every feeling and experience that we have, that Jesus had in flesh to understand where we are and what we're going through. Luke 22, 44 says, he prayed more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. That Jesus is in such anxiety that he literally starts to perspire drops of blood. Scientists tell us that before most people would get to this place, they would have a heart attack. That the stress would have killed them. But many times throughout history that human beings have perspired blood because of the pressure that they're under. Verse 42, Jesus prays, My Father, if it's not possible for this cup of the cross to be taken away unless I drink it, May your will be done. Jesus is simply praying, hey God, in my flesh, in my body, I don't want to go to the cross. But if this is what I need to do to turn it around for all humanity, then I'm going to be willing to do that thing. He's saying, God, I don't want to go to the cross, but I trust you. And I'm so thankful that he did. That Jesus put my needs before the needs of himself. And so while they're there praying, Judas And the religious leaders and the Roman soldiers show up into the garden and Judas walks over and kisses Jesus on the cheek and betrays him with a kiss. And the soldiers grab Jesus and arrest him. Can I tell you that Jesus can relate to feeling betrayed? That if something's happened in your life and someone's betrayed you, that you have a high priest who can sympathize with what you're going through, that Jesus was horribly betrayed by someone that he loved. After that, he's taken into custody on false charges He's beaten, he's put on a mock trial unjustly, and he's lied about. And during this public trial, the religious leaders are going through the crowd and spreading lies. And the very people that were singing Hosanna, which means God save us, now started shouting, crucify him. The people that were just with him are now against him. Jesus knows what it's like to be lied about. He knows what it's like to be abused and treated unfairly. Then a guy named Pontius Pilate, who was a Roman governor, sentences Jesus to death. But not just any death, a criminal's death. Death by crucifixion on a cross. And he demands that he be murdered for crimes that he did not commit. And in this moment, Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect one, was sentenced to die. And they stripped Jesus of his robe, and they beat him with a cat of nine tails 
which is a whip that has nine ends. And they would weave in pieces of bone and glass and stone and they would whip Jesus and it would rip the flesh from his very body. And Jesus took the beating. He bore the stripes on his back for our healing. Then the soldiers, they got some branches with some thorns and they bent them into a crown of thorns. And they placed this crown of thorns on Jesus' head and they beat it into position with a rod. And with every hit, the thorns drove deeper into the skull of our Savior. This beating would have killed any other man, but Jesus had his face set on his Father's mission. He knew what he was called to do and to accomplish. The soldiers then made Jesus carry his own cross up the hill of Golgotha. When Jesus got to the top of the hill, they threw the cross down and grabbed Jesus and threw him down on the rugged cross. And they took some nails and a hammer and they pounded nails through his wrists and nails through his feet and they nailed him to the cross and they stood the cross up and they dropped it in a pre-dug hole on top of the hill. And when it hit that hole, every nerve in Jesus' body was shook. Jesus experienced incruciating pain. The reason we have the word incruciating is because it means the cross, that the cross was excruciating. After Jesus is up on the cross, a soldier grabs a ladder and takes a ladder and leans it up on the cross and climbs the ladder with a sign that he had painted and he nails the sign over Jesus' head that says, King of the Jews. And they put that sign up there mocking not only Jesus, but mocking God. But while on the cross, Jesus' character doesn't change. He's consistent in his love. You see, Jesus was not crucified alone that day. The Bible says that there were two thieves that were crucified on both sides of him. Now, they didn't receive the beating that he received. They were only crucified that day. And in Luke chapter 23, verse 39, it says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. Huh, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God? Even when you've been sentenced to die, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when I come into your kingdom. The thief is saying, Jesus, forgive me, save me, not now, but in eternity. And listen to Jesus' response. And Jesus replied, I assure you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. In this moment of anguish and pain, Jesus still turns it around for one more. Jesus takes the moment to focus on a man to his right who is a criminal, but yet he forgives him. And he says, I would love for you to be in relationship with me. Verse 44 says, it was about noon. And darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. And the light from the sun was gone. And then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. In the book of John, it says that he shouted, It is finished. And in that moment, and with those words, he breathed his last breath. And Jesus gave his life as a sacrifice for all of us. But in that same moment, something incredible happened. It was partnered with a tangible example of what Jesus had accomplished. Scripture says that at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth was shook and the rocks split apart. Remember how I said earlier that for thousands of years, the only way people could be forgiven of their sins was to bring a sacrifice to a priest and then the priest would go behind a curtain and into a room so they could talk to God. It was that curtain in the temple that was torn in two, signifying that Jesus had accomplished his mission, that he had turned it around, that now you and I didn't need a priest to engage with God, that there's no middleman anymore, that you, no matter your sin, no matter your story or your struggle or your situation, that you can gain access to God in heaven because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. This is the message of Easter. 
Matthew 27, verse 54, it says, the Roman officers and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, this man truly was the son of God. That these men who were literally sent to kill him observed his character. They watched him forgive the thief. They heard him say, Father, forgive them. The very men stabbing him, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they were so moved by the love of Jesus that they realized that he was the son of God. But can you imagine what the disciples felt like in this moment? If you were a disciple of Jesus and had been following him and you think that he's there to overthrow the Roman Empire and now he's gone? They're saying, this isn't our plan. This isn't how it's supposed to go. Jesus can't just die. He's supposed to change things. But what the disciples didn't fully understand is that Jesus didn't come to fight the Romans. He came to fight a much bigger enemy on our behalf. He was warring for the salvation of mankind against hell itself against Satan and against his demons, that Jesus was in a much bigger battle than the disciples could even see. And at that moment that Jesus died on the cross, the devil thought he won. And the devil and his demons start to celebrate and shout in hell because they think that they just had victory. But then they hear someone pounding on the gates of hell and it's none other than the Son of God who showed up in hell to take the keys to death, to hell, and the grave. And the reason that we can celebrate today is because Satan no longer has authority over our souls. But God fought a battle that we could not fight on our own so that our whole situation could be turned around. The reason that if you go to a funeral and it's a Christian that has died and you hear the family singing and smiling, it's because they understood that Jesus took the sting out of death. That though we're sad, we don't see the people anymore. That there's going to be a reunion in heaven when we see all of those who went before us because of what Jesus has done through his life. Death, where is your sting? Romans chapter 8 verse 37 says this, Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Nothing. Everyone say nothing. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angel nor demon, neither our fears for today, listen, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the power of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord that what Jesus accomplished on the cross is the thing that can let us know that we're secure in God's hand. If you're in a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter how hard the wind blows or how loud the lion roars or how unknown your future is, you're safe in the hand of God. Philippians chapter two, verse nine. It says, therefore, because of the sacrifice, God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Listen to where? In heaven and on earth and under the earth, that Jesus has full authority. See, the reason that we celebrate Easter is not just because Jesus died, even though that was enough. We celebrate because death couldn't keep him down. We celebrate because he had the power to turn it around. Three days later, after the skies went dark and the curtain was torn and Jesus died, three days later on Sunday morning, Mark chapter 16, verse 2, says just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. Who? Two women. Jesus' mom, Mary, and another woman named Mary Magdalene. Now, what you might not know about this other Mary is that Jesus had just met her about six months before. And do you know where he met her? Jesus was teaching in the synagogue and some religious people found a prostitute 
and they brought her in and threw her at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. No one, go and sin no more. And Mary Magdalene was not only forgiven of her sins, but she turned and was accepted as a disciple of Jesus. And now she's the first one to realize that his resurrection happened. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter what you've done or who you are. Jesus wants to use you to do some incredible things. Just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb to anoint his body. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, was a big hindrance in front of them, that that stone was rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, in a robe, it was an angel sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. The angel said, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified, but he has risen. That in this moment of despair and not knowing what was next and thinking that the plan wasn't what they thought, that Jesus not only paid for their sins, but he rose again, showing us that he has authority even over death. This is who our God is. He's able to turn it around. Jesus has the power over death, but not just a physical death, a spiritual death. And that in him, through Jesus, we can be born again. We can be saved. We can be made new. That we can be washed. That all of the things that throughout this message you've been thinking about that make you not good enough, those very things are what Jesus died for to forgive. None of us are holy. Peter, Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, he said that his righteousness was comparable to filthy rags. It's not about what we've done. It's about what Jesus has done on the cross. That we can be made new through his love. After this, Jesus appeared to the disciples and he did many miracles and then he ascended into heaven, not on some weird winch contraption in the ceiling of a church, but God took him into heaven and the Bible says that even right now, right now, Easter 2020, Sunday morning, right now, that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, petitioning for us, praying for us. We say, well, pastor, what does that mean? It means that when we sin, when we make a mistake, and we say, God, Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? That Jesus looks over at his father, at God, and says, hey, Dad, I died for them. And that the father looks at the son and he says, I know, because of what you did, you turned it around for them. And so I don't know what you've done. But Jesus right now is in heaven praying for you. Now, all we have to do is ask him into our lives. Romans 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. Listen, that while we were still sinners, we had nothing to offer God. Christ, Jesus, died for us. And Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say you have to be perfect. It doesn't say you have to be at church every single week. It doesn't say that you have to have the whole Bible memorized. It says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he rose from the dead for you, that you'll be saved. And so this morning, on this Easter Sunday like never before, it's for you. Right now, there are thousands of people at Living Church watching the service that already know Jesus. And they're praying for you. Those of you who don't know Jesus, they're asking that you would understand that this story is more than a story, but it's a gift from God for your life and for eternity. 
And so I want to give you the opportunity right now in your home or your living room or wherever you're watching online to ask Jesus in your heart. You don't have to be at a church. You don't have to meet me. It's not about me. It's about God. So all across the Metroplex and all across the world, if you would close your eyes and bow your heads with me. This morning, if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, I would ask that you would just pray this. Dear God, forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. From this day forward, I'm going to live for you. My past doesn't matter anymore because you paid for all of it. You washed away all of it. You cleaned all of it at the cross. And so God, make me new. From this day forward, I'm going to live for you, God. And I believe that my best days are ahead of me because of your love. Thank you, God. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me this morning, right now, there's a party in heaven. The Bible says that when one person comes into a relationship with Jesus, that all of heaven rejoices, that all of heaven celebrates because one more person is in a relationship with Jesus. And I want to beg you to not do it alone. Don't try to navigate this life by yourself because like Jesus said, we're going to have trials and struggles. But connect with us at Living Church so we can help teach you what the Word of God says about how we can live our lives. I want to speak to everybody else who already knew Jesus or now does. I know you're scared. I know there's a lot of things that are unknown. I know that it feels like the storm is raging on the outside. But can I tell you that if Jesus is in your boat, if he doesn't calm the storm on the outside, he'll always calm the storm on the inside. So I want to pray peace over you. Father, I ask for every man, every woman, every child, every family that's watching, that you would give them a peace that surpasses understanding. Lord, that you would let them calm down in their mind, calm down in their heart and let them know that they're not going through this life alone but that you're in the boat with them and that you desire to step in and turn it around you did not give us a spirit of fear but one of power and of love and of a sound mind and I speak that over every person watching give them a spirit of power not weakness not of fear but of a sound mind a mind that is steady and steadfast on you. Be with them this week. Be with them in the next coming months and let them know that you are the God of the turnaround. Church, can I tell you that no matter what's happening, that God's going to bring victory into our situation, that he's the God of turning things around. So if you're home, would you stand up with me? Come on, stand up in your living rooms. Stand up in your kitchens. I want Pastor Matt to sing this for us as a declaration that our God is the God of the turnaround. Come on, Living Church. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. And you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. And you turn it for good. Sing. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn for good. And you take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. And you turn it for good. Oh, you take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. And you turn it for good. Victory, I'm gonna see a victory for the battle. 
we worship you today on this Easter Sunday, knowing that you're working every circumstance for our good, that you are the God of the turnaround, and we trust you, and we're so grateful for what you've done for us today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. If you made that decision to follow Jesus this morning, can I tell you, we're so proud of you. We're so excited for the decision that you've made, but this is not the finish line. It's just the beginning of what God wants to do in your life, and we want to be on this journey with you. And so if you do me a couple of things, understand that the more you connect to this house, the more you continue to connect to God's Word, the more He can do in your life. And so if you would text the words, what's next? No spaces, just all one word, what's next to 555-888. That way a pastor and an elder can connect with you and let you know what's next in your journey with the Lord. We have life groups that are happening right now through Zoom calls and there's no reason to wait, but instead you can get connected to the house connected to God's people so you continue to be on this journey with the Lord and we're excited to get to know you better in the near future. We love you and we're so excited for the decision you've made. Now everybody, right now we're about to start the drive through after party and so get up, get your keys, get in your car, come on over together. It's going to be so much fun. We can't wait to see you guys. Easter at Living Church, Easter like never before. It's going to be a blast. We love you guys. See you soon.